From WBEZ Chicago, it's This American Life, distributed by Public Radio International. I'm Eric Glass. And let's head back in time, back to when being on TV meant you sort of half-shouted every single thing you said. Conquest. The search for new knowledge about our universe, our world, and ourselves. The year is 1960. This is the primate laboratory at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. In this laboratory, there are approximately 120 rhesus monkeys, the subject of a study that wants to know the answer to the question, what is an infant's love for its mother? Now, the reason there even was a study asking this very basic question, back when CBS television took a camera crew to Wisconsin, but that is actually the kind of thing that most of us today would find sort of surprising. You see, the researcher that they're filming, a guy named Harry Harlow, was trying to prove, and this is going to sound crazy, he was trying to prove that love is an important thing that happens between parents and children. And the reason why he felt the need to prove this point was at the time, and again, I know this is going to sound kind of out there, the psychological establishment, pediatricians, even the federal government, were all saying exactly the opposite of that to parents. It's actually one of those things that you say, how could they have thought that? But uh, psychology just didn't believe in love. And if you go back and you pull any of the psychology textbooks, really almost pre-1950, you don't even find it in the index because it was not a word that was used. This is Deborah Blum, the biographer of this renegade researcher, Harry Harlow. She writes about how psychologists at the time actually saw loving behavior towards children as a problem, a menace. At one point, the head of the American Psychological Association declared, when you're tempted to pet your child, remember that mother love is a dangerous instrument. Yeah, that was John Watson, and he he actually said there are serious rocks ahead for the over-kissed child and then defined over-kissing as kissing your child more than once a year. Wow. It was, I mean, that was the message of almost everything. Yeah, at some point there, there are government pamphlets, you write, that are warning uh, parents not to touch their children, and, and you quote some. One says, never kiss a baby, especially on the mouth. Don't rock or play with children. Yeah, not to say that everyone follows what so-called experts do, right? But certainly you had an enormous effect of this affection is wrong, love isn't real, trust us, we're scientists, that greatly shaped those kind of perceptions. How is this possible? Well, first of all, psychology was still pretty young. And psychologists hadn't figured out how to measure love, how to quantify it and talk about it in a scientific way. So the thinking about love's role was incredibly crude. And at the same time, this is all at the beginning of the early 20th century, medicine was still figuring out how bacteria spread infections. And pediatricians had noticed that in hospitals, the kids who were picked up a lot by nurses seemed to get more infections. So doctors were saying, don't pick up your child, don't pick up your child, don't pick up your child. Um, So you had a kind of confluence going there. You had pediatricians saying, we're telling you for health reasons that you should never cuddle your child or indulge them. And guess what? Psychology says if you follow those rules, if you show your child no affection, you will make them a better human being. So back off. And this is the way it was for decades, until, by the 1940s, healthcare workers started to notice that some children in hospitals and orphanages who were treated this way, never picked up, never loved, would wither and die, literally die. But even this did not change the opinion of the psychological establishment. So enter Harry Harlow. He says that to prove that love is important. In fact, love is a key to normal development in children, and that what bonds babies and mothers is more than just the baby's need for food. Now, this is what we tried. The responses of the baby monkey are very similar to those of the human baby. This is Harry Harlow on CBS in 1960. In the cage with the baby monkey are two dolls. We constructed two substitute mothers. They have absolute patience. They are available 24 hours a day. The mother hits the baby with love. What he did is he gave them two alternative dummy mothers. One was a wire mother uh, with an ugly face, and one was a cloth mother. She had sort of a fluffy terry cloth body. These are the only mothers these babies ever had. Uh, And in the simplest experiment, baby monkey would be put in a cage with both mothers, but wire mother had the milk. So by all the theories... 
the baby should bond to wire mother because she's feeding him. Here's baby 106. Watch. The little baby monkey, which, by the way, is the most insanely cute thing you have ever seen, scampers onto the wire mother, which is like a, a wire mesh cylinder, boxy head and eyes, apparently made from a billiard ball. The monkey sucks from a bottle that comes out of its chest, and then it runs to cuddle with the other mother. Oh, he's going back. He's back on the cloth mother, and he'll stay on the cloth mother. Actually, this baby spends from 17 to 18 hours a day on the cloth mother, Less than one hour a day on the wire, mother. The monkey rubs itself against the cloth doll until it seems to get some solace from it, and then it relaxes. In other experiments, it comes back to the cloth doll for reassurance when it's put into scary situations. When the cloth mom is nearby, the baby is curious. It walks around and explores. It's confident. And this is how Harlow proved that the relationship between mother and child was more than just about getting food. The baby monkeys needed something else, something that had to do with being cuddled and touched and reassured. It was clear that in this sort of cuddly feeling of affection came all kinds of really important developmental responses. You know, security, curiosity, it's as essential or more essential than being fed. Uh, One of the other Harlow experiments was one in which they took, you know, nice, cuddly, ever-welcoming cloth mother and they made her into an abusive mother or rejecting mother. Harlow called these evil mothers. Uh, so they, uh, one of the cloth moms had brass spikes embedded that would shoot out when the baby monkey held on. I mean, they were blunt-tipped. It didn't cut them mm-hmm. to shreds, but they hurt. Uh, and one was like a shaking mom. He act, Harlow wrote very graphically. He said the babies would... Uh, be shaken until their teeth and bones rattled in unison. Uh, and one would just hurl the baby away, you know, spring-loaded. And what they found was that when the mom quit, you know, spikes retracted um, or shaking stop, the babies came back and they did everything they could to make those mothers love them again. And they cooed and they stroked and they groom and they flirt and exactly what human babies do with their moms. And, and they would abandon their friends. They had to fix this relationship. It was so important to them. Harley spent years as an outcast, fighting for his ideas, before things finally changed. The Harlow, who did so much to convince people that a parent's love for a child is one of the most important things that anyone could ever get or need, he did not have so much success with love in his own life. He was notoriously cold. He had a wicked tongue, and, you know, everyone lived a little bit in fear of it. He was not at all a warm and fuzzy person, and he certainly wasn't a warm and fuzzy, fuzzy father. He um, had four children by two different marriages. Uh, almost all of them, his children, the ones I talked to, remember him as being gone. Was he self-aware enough to, to actually understand how publicly he loved the idea of love, but uh, in his private life he wasn't carrying it out? I don't think he was, maybe until the end of his life. And he had difficulty in a lot of relationships. In a way, of course. Who else would be so interested in how does love work, except for somebody who really needs to figure it out? Well, today on our program, stories of unconditional love. If you can get a monkey to love a terry cloth towel with a cue ball on its head, It doesn't seem like it should be so hard with your own kids, right? We have two stories today of parents and children and exactly what unconditional love gets you. Act one of our show, Love's a Battlefield. Act two, hit me with your best shot. Stay with us. (laughs) 